guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, comedian extraordinaire Mark Ellis. Oh, <laughs> isn't that nice? Welcome one and all to the greatest movie show on the planet of Earth. Thank you guys for joining us. It's going to be a face swap and good time here <laughs> in the studio. It's the month of March, and you know what comes with March, madness, and especially this time because it's Batman versus Superman month. We're only a few weeks away. Ashley, we got a lot of great stories to get to. Who's yeah, in the band? Yeah, also here, the Finstock Destroyer, John Schneider! <laughs> beware the eyes of March, Finstock. Uh, hey, you know what? Before, before every show, I try to save my creative calories and not be funny. I like to just sit here like some kind of weird robot, whatever. <laughs> Also here, director of development, reverse home girl. <laughs> uh, I yeah, I'm not gonna even get into. It. We I wish we had the cameras on us right before this too, because that was a it was a fun banter. <laughs> I would say I would say a fight. That there we got was into. some debate as to what our pre-show routines were and whether yep. they cross streams or not. Mm -hmm. What's definitely not gonna cross anybody's streams is the excitement we have over the new shows that we have at Collider Video, and we want to let you guys know the Walking Dead recap show is back. They did it right after the Oscars, and you can check it out right now on Collider Video's YouTube channel, where you're currently hanging out. Along with that, John Schnapp and I had the privilege of doing a trailer reaction slash review for the brand new Ice Age Collision Course trailer. Go watch it whenever you get a chance. You might be surprised as to how Mr. Shep and I feel <laughs> about Collision Course. There's been a lot of Ice Age movies. This is the most recent one, and uh, we can't wait to share it with you Go get those nuts, kids. Get actually, those nuts. It just went live, <laughs> I know, I, so you can check out this. Ashley, come on, Ashley. Do you have any <laughs> thoughts about going to get nuts? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I do have some news stories for you. Oh, Let's have those instead. <laughs> All right, Lionsgate has officially announced the start of production and plot synopsis for their Power Rangers movie entitled Sabin's Power Rangers. The movie will bring back the original character names of Jason, Billy, Kimberly, Trini, and Zack, along with villain Rita Repulsa, played by Elizabeth Banks. The story will follow five ordinary high school kids who must become something extraordinary when they learn that their small town of Angel Grove and the world is on the verge of being obliterated by an alien threat. Chosen by destiny, our heroes will quickly discover that they are the only ones who can save the planet. The movie will be released March 24th, 2017. Mark, are you excited for a Power Rangers movie? Uh, uh, kind of nope, but uh, look, I, the description is what I was expecting to read when you're talking about a Power Rangers movie. My big question is when these five superheroes come together in high school, do they say, hey, guys, we should all be the Power Rangers? Or do they say, hey, guys, we should all be Sabin's Power Rangers? Right, like, Sabin. Is that the name that they agreed on, or is that just going to be the name on the poster and annoy the crap out of the fans? If you are a fan of Power Rangers, which I was never one growing up. This should intrigue you. I mean, look, it's going to be the origin story. We're rebooting Power Rangers for a new generation. There's going to be a lot of nostalgia for the old one, I'm sure, but it's shuttling it into a new generation. That's got to be some cause for celebration amongst Power Rangers fans, you would think. When you read the description, though, I can't help but think Fantastic Four. I mean, it sounds a lot yeah. like that, where we get another origin story of kids who have special powers. They come together to fight this really scary threat. It's coming out in March 2017, the right time to release this movie, and I'm glad we at least know what we're getting ourselves in for. Schnepp, I know you're a huge Power Rangers fan. Oh, what do you think of this? That's right. I've watched all of but maybe one Power Rangers in my entire life. But uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of Power Rangers, but honestly, that picture that I guess Ray Ora found online, if they look like that, that's kind of like a weird Power Rangers Tron look. Yeah. I was like, damn, that looks kind of cool. And I know that's not, now that I know that's not what it looks like, and that's just either a comic book or Ray just found some fan art or something. They look like very colorful bikers. I'm yeah. just saying, they look like it's like a Daft Punk freak fest. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, it's like it would be cool music. They're fighting weird aliens, and they are all everything's glowing. I would see that movie. Everything else about it, Saban's Power Rangers, dumb kids in high school wearing motorcycle helmets, forget it. And look, I don't want it to sound like we're not in excited for all of you who are excited for Power Rangers. It's just that I didn't grow up caring about them. Christian, right. did you? Uh, no, I didn't. And I don't. And I don't. I think I missed. I missed my generation. But I think as far as I don't think Power Rangers fans are going to be so excited about this either. I think that a lot of Power Rangers fans. Not only a lot. There were some Power Rangers fans that didn't like that. Uh, what's the What's the dude? That Power made? Rangers. Yeah, it was. Power, us, uh, no, the, what's this guy's uh, name? Jo jo Joseph Kahn is the no, director. The guy that was Adi on your, Shankar produced it. Yeah. Yes, that one that Katie Sackhoff was in. And, yeah. and, we, and when that one came out, 
that was that was something that brought in a lot of people who weren't like fans. Like and I know that you can't really go that dark with the Power Rangers movie. It's just not not the audience. But when you see a picture like that, you go, oh, maybe this could be hopeful. But it's not what it's going to be. I'm thinking. I'm thinking from hearing this, we're going to get more of like Gem and the Holograms mm. or something along those. You lines. You know what's a or real a real big? No, it's a sign a sign of something that's wrong. Is there's like eleven writers. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I was like, I how many? Because somebody said, yeah, Max Landis wrote it. I was like, oh, cool. And then I looked at the writers. I was like, Max Landis plus like 17 other people. I just added six. Landis had a like, Landis had a draft that right. they completely just discarded. So, right. so he still have his name just so he gets paid He just paid has his money. name on there. Like yeah. the, the one that he had, because we had heard that he had done it a while ago. Right. And then I had heard from someone else that he he did. And they just kind of said, no, we don't want to go in that Isn't direction. That weird? That's, That's what they always do to cool. Landis. They're like, write us a draft. Then we're going to rewrite it. Yeah. They, so it's it's like, like they love part of his ideas and they just take it and bastardize it and such. To weird where you can't really tell where it came from in the first place. We're not saying this movie isn't going to be an unmitigated disaster. However, wouldn't you think that if you were, were a Power Ranger fan, you at least want to see how they became the Power Rangers? You guys, as I am a, just I, as a kid was a huge Power Rangers fan. I nice. want to be the Pink Ranger so bad. And? and I'm not even uh, the age. The timing is just strange. But do like, we do that? Do we start with them in high school gaining their powers, or should it might we just be cool because I heard some rumors that Josh Hutcherson might be in talks, but they're just sheer rumors, and that they're trying to go kind of like a Spider-Man, like Sam Raimi kind of route with this, which sounds super yeah, cool. So if fun. they take that route, that'd be awesome. But for me, as a, I was a fan, like a hardcore fan growing up, and that just. It's not even piquing my interest. This picture looks cool, though. It yeah. kind of depends what route they take, I guess. Yeah, I think I'm worried about it. If it goes, if it goes that route, like the Sam Raimi kind of Spider-Man, even with, with some humor, but could still uh, fill into the camp and still be serious. Right. I think that could be fun, and I and who knows, could win me over. But if they go just total camp and just not, I don't know, like to go to the, to the same feel that they had of the show, it's not going to play in the movies. Yeah. It's a tough tone to hit. Maybe it becomes the next Fantastic Four. Maybe it's the next Chronicle, which was also high schoolers discovering new powers. We're going to have to wait until March 24, 2017 <laughs> to find out. Ashley, in the meantime, let's go to a galaxy far, far away. All right. Two weeks back, production on Star Wars Episode Eight was announced with a short teaser video of director Ryan Johnson shooting a scene with Mark Hamill and Daisy Ridley. Since since then, speculation speculation has pointed to Episode Eight being the first Star Wars movie to pick up directly after the end of the previous. MTV caught up with Ridley on the red carpet at the Academy Awards on Sunday night, where she seemingly confirmed the idea, saying, "Me and Mark Hamill have been rehearsing a lot, and it's really amazing. When we went back to Skellig to do the opening of Eight, it was so crazy doing the same scene with a different crew of people. He's amazing to rehearse with, and I'm very excited to be doing the rest of the stuff." When asked if Luke Skywalker would be involved this time, Ridley added, It's such a good story. Seriously, Luke is so cool in this one, really. Episode 8 will debut in theaters December 15, 2017. Shinep, do you like the idea of Episode 8 picking up directly after Episode 7? Absolutely not. I think it's horrible. No, I love it. <laughs> I, can't, I cannot wait. That ending was like, <gasps> no, Luke didn't even get to say anything. So I'm glad that they're going to pick right up where they left it off. And I'm really excited to see the 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 next episode see where uh, Johnson takes it he's a great writer I love all his films so far I love Looper so I'm all 100% on board for the continuity to just rock on and you know what they could always do is it could start right there and then cut to like the credit crawl and then four years later yeah. so she could be in training and all this other stuff they might pick up where they left off but it could also then jump forward in time so it makes total sense to me but it does beg the question like okay after we get off the island we see that opening exchange with her giving him the lightsaber and then they have some sort of conversation where do we go from there are we picking up those events or are we going to do a flash forward mm -hmm. from there look I'm going to be cool with whatever they want to do with these movies but this one unlike previous Star Wars films seems to make the most sense where you have to pick up right where you left off because because, like, take the, the end of The Empire Strikes Back. Phenomenal movie. It ends with Luke putting his hand over Leia's shoulder. And it's like, all right, we got to take some time. we got to lick our wounds. I don't care what happened the rest of that evening. You know, I, I didn't need to know that. I can pick up a couple years later or a couple months later, however long it took for them to get to Tatooine and go rescue Han. This is a totally different situation. This is a dude we've been waiting to see what he's been up to for the last three decades. And we finally got one picture of him at the end of a movie. And he's about to say something. And then, boom credits mm. there was no after credit scene so we have no idea what's going to come out of his mouth we as fans deserve to see 
what Luke Skywalker is like right when we meet him. We don't want to read it in a crawl text. Like right. we don't want to. The worst thing Episode Eight could have done is open with the crawl text. Like Luke and Ray have been hanging out for a while, and she's getting in really good shape. No, we need to see this from the beginning. But it's also great to see that Daisy Ridley is saying how cool Luke Skywalker is in this movie. Christian, rumor on the internet says that you're kind of a big Star Wars fan. You read this. What were your thoughts? Well, the first thing is that when we talked about this on Jedi Council, is that they went back to Skelly Michael Island a while ago. So because it's it's hard to film there, so they had to get permission again to film there. Back in so, September. Yeah, so they had to get permission to film there again. So the chances are that's when they filmed this, and Ryan Johnson has been in it for that long to get both Luke and and and, and Luke and and Ray together to do that scene before the movie even came out. So you know he had already seen that scene and to shoot it again because that's why they were able to kind of I guess pick up on it. So it was, a lot of people think that that happened when whenever they released that thing it was about a month ago. Yeah. Didn't happen a month ago, right. but the fact that we are we have never had a Star Wars movie that has been directly from one scene to another. It's always been a time lapse. I think episode right. one was like ten years, and then three or whatever it was. So this is nice to see it continue. I agree with you, Schnepp. I think it's very possible that if you wanted to, you could do that. We got to find out what they say. What does she? What does he say? <laughs> Everyone wants to know what the right. hell happened there too. Because I think that you would be doing yourself a disservice if you just jumped and didn't show them at least have some kind of conversation. Now, whether or not they reveal who the hell she is to him in that conversation as the dad, a teacher, whatever it might be, something has to ha happen in that conversation because it's, the lead up was for so long. You know what he says? He says, do you have any food? Right, There's right, no food. Right. There's just nothing. This island. nothing. I haven't and, eaten for and 30 what's years. That, what's that gravestone there? That's yeah. creepy. Dad, um, so yeah, that that <laughs> it's right. They've been hanging out a lot together. It could yeah. be good father it's, daughter yeah. bonding time. But she just starts shaving him. Oh, I'm yeah. trying. Try, it's like Encino Man. We just got to throw him in a bath and yeah. get this thing cleaned up. I'm also wondering, like, it, it has a Star Wars movie ever? I'm trying to think. I've seen the movies a few times. Have they ever, in the middle of a movie, jumped from like one point in time to another one? Even if it's like a week later, I think they've been pretty continuous as far as the story unfolding. You know, maybe it took a little bit of time for Luke to finally get to Dagobah in Return of the Jedi, and then for him to finally leave Yoda's disappearing carcass, and then come back and hang out with the rest of the Rebellion. Well, but for the most part, it's a pretty streamlined storytelling. Look at Empire Strikes Back. He's at it, studying with Yoda for, yeah. a, a, you know, not just one day. He's training with him. So time elapses. So yeah. we don't know how many weeks have elapsed, but it's not just a day and then he takes off. He studies to be a Jedi. So it's probably a couple yeah. weeks. Yeah, it's definitely a couple weeks. I mean, because that's you assume that's how long that Han and Leia were in Cloud City. They were there for a little bit, too, before, you know, they got Spoiler alert. Unless we get into the else that happened yeah. in the original trilogy. But, but as far as Luke um, being a part of it, this is what we were talking about. because, And she also knows, Daisy really has been very good leading up to episode seven of what she can and cannot say. There is a reason that she was talking about Luke to MTV or whoever it was. There was a reason because she's allowed to. Mm -hmm. Luke is going to be the heavy marketing material here. He has to be because if you don't have him in this movie a lot and you don't tell everybody Luke is a big part of this movie, people are going to be pissed off. So for her to say he's really cool in it, great. I know you're excited about that. Christmas two years from now cannot come fast enough. Ashley, we're going from the galaxy to the distant past, mm -hmm. namely ancient Egypt. Over the weekend, newly released Gods of Egypt pulled in just over 14 million at the box office on a budget of over 140 million. Ouch. With negative reviews coming from the majority, director Alex Proyas has taken to Facebook to defend his movie in a long rant aimed squarely at every critic who didn't like his film. Within the epic long post, Proyas calls modern film critics less than worthless and deceased vultures pecking at the bones of a dying carcass. The Facebook post is still up for all to see at this moment. Christian, what are your thoughts on Alex Proyas' Facebook rant against critics? Oh, totally warranted. Are you kidding me? Shut up, you baboon. What are you talking about? This is so stupid for you to say this. It pisses me off. The fact that this guy is, I like Alex Proyas a lot. It's like, dude, you are in the game. You're in the game. You know how it works. I guarantee you if someone would have said like, I love that movie. Oh, I'm so glad they loved it. I love that critic. Is it because you made a shit bomb, you are now going, <laughs> oh, man, I can't believe that they don't like it. It's terrible. It has nothing to do with the whitewash thing. It's because you made a piece of garbage. That is why. That's the only reason reason 
And this dude is getting so pissed off with his Facebook rant. And you and I were talking about this before, Schnepp, as far as like Josh Trank. Remember what Josh mm -hmm. Trank, when Josh Trank went out there and he did the same thing, he went, oops, deleted his tweet. Right. Also, Josh Trank's about 26, 27 right. years old. This guy's 187. He should know, shh, shh. He should be the one calling Josh Trank and going, nah, you know what? It's part of it. The critics are going to like some of the ones you, know, you do and they're, they're going to hate some of the ones. Right. You know, just shush. Shush, this really pisses me off as a guy who is a film fan. Now, I don't consider myself a critic. I consider myself someone who talks about movies. And the fact that he wants film fans to talk about movies. And if he makes something he loves, he's going to want us to talk about it. Because he's tearing after people on the internet. And people the way that people are now on the internet. It was, oh, back in the day, it was only the print people. It was like... Now it's about because he's like that's the age of the tax. Is this pisses me off? I'm a big Alex Proyas fan. I love Dark City. I love The Crow. You made a stinker. Shut your face. Go make a better one. Wow. You know uh, your T-shirt says shave your head and go to sleep. He's already got a shaved head. So yeah. really, all the guy needs to do is take a nap to please Christian. That's all you got to do. Go ahead, put your head on a pillow, and you're going to be fine. Look, I, first of all, when was the last time you saw Christian get more animated right. over Gods of Egypt story than a Star Wars story? Right. But look, I, I, I personally do not have a problem with him doing this because it is a movie that he made, and he cares a lot about it. So it's natural to have these feelings. Now, would I have gone on Facebook and railed against everybody who didn't like my movie? No. You kind of understand going in that this is the job. Look, in exchange for you getting to be a director, a big time Hollywood director, and put your name on a movie, you have to accept the price of admission. They're gonna pay you a lot of money to make these things, but when these things come out and your name's attached to it, if it's not good, that's gonna be mainly blamed on you, okay? You are the quarterback, so if your team wins the Super Bowl, you get all the glory. If your team loses, they're probably gonna put a lot of blame on you, and you have to be prepared for that. I know it sucks, okay? I'm a, I'm a certified critic on Rotten Tomatoes. I also do stand-up every night. So I know that I'm walking on both sides of it. You have to have thick skin if you're going to be in this business. This is art. You create it out of a love for doing whatever you're doing. But when you create it, now it's in the world. And people in the world are not always going to see eye to eye on what you did, particularly with a movie like Gods of Egypt, which was just not a good film. I'm sorry that I feel differently than you do. And I'm not saying that everybody else on the internet needs to agree with me that it's garbage. If you go see Gods of Egypt and you really enjoyed it, that's fine. I'm happy for you. I'm glad that you got some happiness out of that movie. Personally, I wasn't let down because I think the movie looked good to begin with and I got pretty much what I was expecting. I saw the movie. Schnepp, did you see the movie and have you ever had critics attack you for something you did and railed against them in this fashion? Um, uh, no and yes. Uh, I'll say I'll say I have not seen the movie yet. I'm still even though everyone has told me uh, that they did not enjoy it. I still I liked that trailer. You love the trailer. And it reminded me of some kind of weird future version of a Ray Harryhausen film. And other people have told me that is not what it is. So I, I still have to see it for myself um, as a filmmaker and also someone who comes on this show and talks about other people's films. It is a, it's a, a line you have to walk and you have to just uh, be yourself and be true to yourself. So I could say whatever I ever say about anyone else's film to their face and not be a, like afraid to say, hey, you know what? I did not like this film and argue with them if they if they wanted to talk about it. I mean, it would be a discussion. But for every film that I've seen of a, a filmmakers that I didn't like, most of the time they've done three or four films that I loved. So it's like it's the same thing with some uh, someone like Alex Proyas. I mean, I absolutely love The Crow. I think Dark City is a, is an incredible science fiction masterpiece. It's like an amazing. I agree. It's like a it's like a Black Mirror from the past. It's an, a Twilight Zone a movie. So it's like it's one of these things that he's done some amazing, incredible work. I'll say Garage Days is not one of those films for me. I haven't seen Gods of Egypt, so I don't know about whether or not I'm gonna hate it or I'll maybe it'll I'll find it mediocre. Or maybe I'll love it. I don't know yet. Uh, I think the reaction is what uh, definitely Christian is talking about and. You know, I can see it from both sides. Like, as someone who puts, if you put like three years of your life into something, like I did with my film, The Death of Superman Lives, what happened? Ninety-two percent of Rotten Tomatoes, guys. But damn, um, really? Yeah, it's kind of weird. But uh, if if everybody <laughs> hated on it, and believe me, I got some hate. A couple of critics really, really kicked my ass. Like, hey, guy keep, keeps nodding his head, and it's boring. It's a fan film, this and that. When you read people who are just ripping on your film that you just spent three years of your life on, it hurts a little bit. But at the same time, that's their opinion. And I don't feel that way about my film. And I'm glad a lot of other people don't. So to react to it is the thing that you need to, as an adult, 
in this world of the internet and the web and the you know I could just post something on on Twitter and, and everybody's absorbing it it might have been a moment of I'm in pain I need to protect myself like Josh Trank I need to let people know that I had a movie that I liked before they ruined it and he he wrote that but it's like look dude it's not just you it's a whole you know what I mean like he shouldn't have done that he knows he shouldn't have done it what Alex Price did is reactionary I don't think he really even believes everything he said he's reacting like a hurt person in a corner striking out I wouldn't get that mad about it. I mean, I, I understand your I understand My, your anger, but at the same time, I feel like he's just he's lashing out because whether or not he made a stinky film or you know big poop, you know it's like whatever. A lot of people <laughs> don't like it. He's put all like three years of his I, life, and I, in. and I get that. I understand. My 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 gripe is not the fact that he shouldn't be upset because look, we get we all get comments and stuff too. People say things about you, and you go, look, we're human beings. He's a human being right. that he should be. Like you said, he put a lot of time and effort into this thing, and he loves it. And so when you read something that sucks. My thing is that what right does he have to then destroy other people's careers and stuff? Because he's going after people's careers. There are people out here that do what we do and other people who are who are very like also love Alex Proyas movies, but he's taking shots at them in their career and what they do and calling them vultures because they didn't like his movie. Boo hoo. That's part of the game. That's like you don't have to like what they're saying about you, but and as far as being reactionary and using Josh Trank, Josh Trank didn't go after the critics. No. He went after the guys behind it. Now it was a different situation where Proyas started started defending like himself against why well, I didn't like my decisions being made and now people are seeing not what I did but he is basically attacking me he's attacking Mark he's attacking you he's attacking everyone who reviews movies and right. talks about movies that's what he's doing and I that's think, why I say for him to shut his face right and I I see what you're saying and I think eventually he'll uh, retract his I hope so and apologize and say look I was hurt <laughs> right and that's pretty much I'm a big, say, look, <laughs> I am a fan of Proyas I want to <laughs> say that I Dark City and The Crow I love those movies I wanted Gods of Egypt to be good people are going oh you see it i went and went and watched it after i didn't do the review it's terrible it's not a good movie it's dopey it doesn't know what it wants to be it's stoinks so as far as like you know it, it's just but hang that's on fine. a second seventh son i mean it's um, it's 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 in the vein i i i would probably rather watch seventh son again i think really? over gods of egypt and look gods of egypt it can be there's parts of it that can be entertaining and again when i see this movie i'm not watching it being like man everything in this movie's so good it's just that alex Proyas messed it up it's not i'm not totally blaming it on him but i'm telling you that when you are the director or the lead actor for that matter or you're the studio that put it out you are going to receive the lion's share of the credit when it's great and a lot of the blame when it's bad mm -hmm. and that's the contract that you sign so you have to deal with it i also don't mind him posting about this on his facebook page he wants to rant about right. it and attack me or whoever else that's his right yeah, he got free speech it's man. his you personal can do whatever the hell it's you his want. personal you can page. open an account on facebook hell go to your myspace page go to twitter wherever you feel like doing it you can mark, go ahead and do mark, it you have MySpace the right to do doesn't it. exist anymore what? It, it does MySpace no one uses it no though. i'm on friendster what? friendster oh, is friendster. this brand new technology that's no, Sorry. I'm going to go on a rant about MySpace not being around anymore. I miss you, Tom. Where's Tom? All right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, most people would sell MySpace stock right now. Will we buy or sell these stories coming up? That's the name of the segment. <laughs> Ashley, what are we selling today? Well, on the red carpet for the Academy Awards, MTV News <clears throat> caught up with Spotlight actor Liv Schreiber and asked him about the possibility of appearing as Sabretooth again in Wolverine 3. Though it's still, not a, it, though it's still a bit early to discuss casting, Schreiber did confirm that he has been contacted by Hugh Jackman about the possibility. He told MTV, we talked about it, I don't know. He's mentioned it to me. The old man Logan storyline, that's appealing. That's something that I can do. Old being the operative word. No plot details as of yet for Wolverine 3, though Jackman did tease the old man Logan storyline at Comic-Con this past summer. Wolverine 3 doesn't have an official title, but is scheduled for release on March 3rd, 2017. Mark Byersell, Liv Schreiber coming back for Wolverine 3. Oh, God, I'm going to buy it, but it's a lot harder to do than I thought it would be because I think Liev Shriver's great. I love him as an actor, whether he's doing something where he gets to be a badass like a Ray Donovan or when he's the more quiet or reserved like he was in Spotlight. The guy is fantastic. He's on the A-list as far as performance goes for sure. But having him in a new Wolverine movie, it makes me very anxious because I don't know if that means that we're going to be acknowledging that Wolverine Origins was ever a real thing right. or that we're going to make Sabretooth related somehow to Wolverine. If we can get away from that stuff, Deadpool did a great job of making fun of it. If we can just take a page out of that book and say, look, we're just going to kind of retcon what happened there. And now we're going to tell the old man Logan story involving Sabretooth in an entirely different capacity. 
then yeah, I'm so excited about it. But just hearing that they're talking, it's like how much of that, you, you just don't want it to be a situation. I think Hugh Jackman is smart enough to realize this, as is Fox, that we do not want to have a situation where we're just going down with a sinking ship. We're defending a movie that just was not received well. People didn't like the storylines. They didn't like how they changed the characters and the relationships from the comic book lore, which they do love. So as long as we can have the freedom to tell a different story and not make these guys brothers that fought in all these wars together like it showed us at the beginning of that movie. I'm going to be cool with this, and it's a huge buy for me. Christian, you probably saw what we have on the red carpet. Did. First of all, is he a badass in person, intimidating, and do you buy this? Intimidating? No, because he's, he's very kind of welcoming to people too, but he's definitely a badass, so I'll, I'll buy that. Um, <laughs> as far as him being saber to the movie, I'm actually going to sell it. Yeah. Um, the reason why I'm going to sell it also is, I, for me, I was a big... Wolverine, Sabretooth, like in the comics, that was my favorite storyline. I actually thought Tyler Maine played, had a better look as Sabretooth. A better look. Leif Shriver's clearly the, the better actor, and I think why people liked him so much in the movies because he's such a phenomenal actor. But it wasn't the Sabretooth that I remembered from the comics. They weren't brothers in the in the comics. Mm -hmm. um, am, I, am I right there? Were they, I'm, I'm pretty sure they, they might were. have retconned that. I, Maybe I they retconned. I don't remember them being brothers. But the thing is, if they play with the canon here in for X-Men and how it works too, because it got a lot of the stuff got wiped out. But Wolverine and Sabretooth's relationship seems to be before any of that stuff mm -hmm. got wiped out. So it would still he would still be his brother. So they could make it work. Um, I just hope that they make it more of the kind of saber tooth Wolverine relationship that was in the first X Men and was in the comic books. Mm -hmm. If they do bring him, I'm not going to be like a hard sell if they bring him back because it's Liev Schreiber. Right. So I just want him to go more to the traditional saber tooth. Schnepp, we got one by one sell. Break the tie. I'm going to buy it. Uh, the reason I'm buying it is that's the only part of Wolverine X Men Origins that I actually liked was the beginning where they kind of went with these two brothers through time. And they established that Wolverine had this brother, that they had this kind of weird relationship. And Liev Schreiber is a great actor. So he actually brought a lot of characterization to the character of Sabretooth, a lot of depth that I don't mm -hmm. think maybe wasn't there before. So uh, to see him in uh, this Old Man Logan story, I'm also interested to see what other characters, because Fox owns all of the Fantastic Four characters. So they could have Doctor Doom be a villain in this. They could have a lot of these other Fantastic Four villains be in the, in the X-Men movie, as well as a ton of the X-Men villains. They just can't have the Hulk. They can't have, you know, a bunch of other characters that are in the Old Man Logan storyline from the comic books. But it's a very adaptable uh, comic book. I think, you know, I'm excited to see them do this storyline. And just like the Wolverine sequel had nothing to do with Wolverine Origins, I think this third one is going to be enough in the future where it can kind of discard everything and just that you don't have to really touch on X-Men Origins, just that he's his brother. Well, yeah, you're right. If you just have them as brothers, I can handle that. That's not going to be the issue of the movie. My problem with that would be is that a harbinger of other things that we're bringing back from X-Men Origins, because I agree right. with you. That first 10 minutes of that movie, I was like, hey, I don't remember them being brothers, but this is so good so far. Right. I'm on board with whatever this movie wants to do. <laughs> I loved Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool in the first 10 minutes. That opening action scene where they go charge that base was phenomenal. Oh. And then Wolverine got got animated claws and he hangs out with a farmer <laughs> and the rest of the movie just got worse and worse and worse as the end we all That's know right. Deadpool did not get a chance to talk because yeah. he said his mouth shut yeah. don't do any of that crap I think we can all acknowledge this is going to be a better movie like Wolverine 3 is going to be a much better movie yeah. even if they keep some of those annoying story points that fans don't like is this going to be the last time that we see Wolverine don't you think that he should have a worthy foe whether it's Liev Schreiber or not do you think Sabretooth should be involved somehow in this new movie yeah I think so I'd like to see, again, it was my favorite storyline from the comics. I'd like to see it recreated. It was done pretty well in, in the first X-Men. The way that it panned out in Origins didn't work out, so I think he deserves another telling. Schnapp? Yeah, definitely, and I can't wait to see how they, you know, supposedly this is Hugh Jackman's last movie, never say never, right. you know? I mean, you, you got to think you're going to see him. Now he's going to pop up in Apocalypse, right? Will they tease a Wolverine Sabretooth thing? And the other question is, what is going to be the involvement of a Sabretooth in an Old Man Logan story? They've already proven they don't have to stick to the comic books with this stuff. So are you going to shoehorn him in there in just a cameo? Are they going to fight? Is he going to finally prove his dominance over Sabretooth? Or will they be going toe-to-toe -to -toe the entire movie? We're going to have to wait a while to find out that answer. But maybe we'll get some casting news very, very soon. Okay, Ash, what's next? Many fans of George Miller have wondered about his 
his failed Justice League movie that almost made it to filming before being abruptly canceled before a single frame of film. And now, thanks to a tip from a casting call looking for small parts and extras on Justice League Part 1, the film's credits list none other than George Miller as a producer, alongside Batman vs. Superman producers Charles Roven and Deborah Snyder, who will also be back for Justice League. Miller was once rumored to take the helm on Men of Steel 2, but no news on that front has come to fruition. Jeanette Byersell, George Miller, as a producer on Justice League. Hmm, seeing as I was the one who started that Man of Steel rumor, I seem to be correct in something, which is just nothing, really. The Oracle um, strikes yeah. again! Yeah, I guess I was right about something. Uh, I think, uh, you know, he was meeting with DC Comics and talking about this stuff, that much I do know, and it didn't work out. He's doing something else. Maybe it's another Mad Max film. Maybe it's something else. Maybe he's just producing the next Mad Max movie. And maybe he's going to move on to maybe doing something like The Flash. Or who, know, who knows what he's going to do. But he's getting his hands in back into the pie. Just like he was originally going to direct Justice League Mortal back in 2008. The writer's strike happened and that movie then didn't happen. He's getting his hands back into the DC Universe. And just as a director, just as a producer this time. So I think it's great. I'll buy it. Christian, getting your wild out? Yeah, I buy it that he's, uh, obviously, I mean, look, he's coming off of, I was talking to a bunch of people last night that hadn't even seen Mad Max, and just because of everything that it did just for the Oscars, they're like, oh, sh should I see Mad Max? Are you kidding me? It's one of the best movies of the year, and what he did, it's all him, man. It was all him. Obviously, he had an amazing team, but it was his vision that he was able to do that, and because he is now being a producer on the Justice League, yeah, I want to see him do something else. I think it's a good way for them to get him involved a little more. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he can take some past ideas, the stuff that he worked on, if it, if it works with the vision that they're looking for with the DC Cinematic Universe, it's great. So how could you not buy? But real, real quick, uh, I wanted to hear your point. Then I wanted to talk. Oh, thanks. I wanted to ask you something about the the. We didn't get into it about the pre-sales with uh with the Batman and Superman stuff too. Sure, we'll get to that right yeah. after. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I forgot. Take. I forgot. I didn't buy get it. it, Christian. Yeah. Back to you. Uh, I look. I, I think George. Not yet. <laughs> I, uh, George Miller is a guy that you get excited about any project he's involved in simply because he's George Miller and he made such a phenomenal movie this past year with Mad Max Fury Road. All the Academy Awards and all that stuff. It's cherry on on top of a great dish that we all got to enjoy. It was such a visually stunning movie. I wonder if him being a producer on this, if that, because Zack Snyder is such a visual guy anyway, it's like, will that will, will that be like a LeBron going to Miami situation, where it's just more good players together, or will it be too many cooks in the kitchen that are all trying to settle on what we need for this one shot? Schnapp, as far as being a director and working with other producers and stuff, I know that the director generally has the final say, but when you bring on a George Miller, are you expecting him to help out the director or just kind of give some ideas and then back off? It, it, it depends on what the project is. If you're uh, producing and directing and then you bring in, uh, bring on other producers, they're there to help. They're there to like, you know, throw some ideas at you, bounce off, you know, hey, what about this? What about that? You know, and I think George Miller is that kind of guy. He's a team player. I mean, he basically storyboarded that entire Mad Max Fury Road film with Brendan McCarthy an amazing illustrator and artist and they basically kind of like visually came up with a story Brendan McCarthy has visually he gets story credit but he visually just kind of drew out every single shot so I think someone like George Miller who's visually an, an amazing genius you want that guy to be a producer on your film because he'd, be, he'd come in and be like hey here's this layout he'd be like well what about this shot did you think about adding that you'd be like thank you so I think it's a great idea and now for breaking news we go to the director of development Christian Harloff well, I was I was just wondering if you guys had any thoughts on the pre-sales the pre-sales went for Batman v Superman we didn't talk about it at all um, right. so I think that they're projecting it to do 140 Right. Opening weekend. Do you think that it's gonna? It's your, look, yeah. you're Nostradamus here. You are, are you going over over two hundred? Over two hundred. Yeah. So I'm. I am not going to doubt you anymore. I wouldn't have gone that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm still. I'm. I'm still. I'd probably be wrong going against Schnepp here, but I think it's going to do about one seventy. This year proved, though, or last year, I guess, now proved that we we really don't know what we're measuring anymore when it comes to pre-sales. Right. I mean, I don't know what the pre-sales were for Jurassic World. We certainly know that they were record numbers for The Force Awakens. We saw how that turned out as well did anybody know before fast and furious came out or furious 7 whatever the hell that movie was called that it was going to do that well not just repeat business but that opening weekend number so look it's great i'm 
happy that they're already projecting a number that high. I think that's only going to pick up. And, and you know, you, you would hope that a movie picks up momentum going into it, whether it's Gods of Egypt or Batman versus Superman. You want people excited about the product that's about to hit theaters. So I think once we get Batman versus Superman, the true fever is going to set in that week and people buzzing about it. So maybe it's going to go well above that projected number. I bet $2 million, $200 million right on the nose. Wow. I think it's going to be just perfect it's really i'm looking at the live chat and people are throwing in their predictions there's a it's it's ranging between about 160 some people have 220 the reason why i think it's gonna be a little harder to hit the 200 so it's two and a half hours yeah. long uh that's I, a long I, movie I, I was gonna throw that into the the runtime limits the amount of movies right. that you can have per day so that could actually hurt it a little bit as far as being able to get over that 200 right. million uh mark by the way I was uh, correct with uh, F uh, Furious 7. I predicted over 150 million. No, I don't believe that ever happened. happened. Someone it's, needs to find go that. go back and watch the movie talk. I know you, hit, I, you definitely hit Deadpool and you hit yeah. Force Awakens. And Awake, Furious 7 sure. I did as well. well I, and I, Guardians. I, By the way, whatever. It's just a couple we'll movies. We'll see. But this, this one, you might, it's not you even might, a big deal, guys. The two and a half hour might might hurt your streak no, here, I, though. I, I completely agree. I'm just, I think it'll it'll do 200 just because of word of mouth Yeah. and every single it's just selling out everywhere you know what's gonna be really exciting 25, is, 210, is the day that we come on this show and we get to do the opening this week segment brought to you by our friends at amc theaters about batman versus superman however that is not this week although we are at that segment it's opening right. this week brought to you by our friends at amc theaters ashley what's coming out well opening this weekend is london has fallen directed by babak najafi the sequel to olympus has fallen the story is about the death of the british prime minister which gathers the world's most powerful leaders in London to pay their respects. Without warning, terrorists unleash a devastating attack that leaves the city in chaos and ruins. Secret Service agent Mike Banning, played by Gerard Butler, springs into action to bring U.S. President Benjamin Asher, played by Aaron Eckhart, to safety. When Asher falls into the hands of the sinister organization, it's up to Banning to save his commander-in-chief from a horrible fate. You know, Christian, I don't know what the pre-numbers for the box office are for London is Fallen, but I I know that if you put that on the poster and you put prepare for bloody hell, you're getting Mark Ellis's dollar opening weekend. This looks like such a silly, ridiculous, but fun action movie premise. My big question is going to be, look, so now President Asher has been taken, not, not once, but twice. He's been taken captive somewhere. How do you run for re-election if you've been kidnapped? How do you tell people I'm going to be a great leader of the free world if you've been kidnapped twice? Gerard Butler, you got your hands full with this one, but I'm looking forward to this. Christian? Uh, I am also looking forward to it. Look, this is the the first one. Olympus has fallen. Was the best Die Hard sequel we got since uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance. Since Under Siege. Yeah, yeah, Die Hard with a Vengeance. That was the best. I mean, it felt like a Die Hard movie. Like I haven't felt that with actual Die Hard in a very long time. Was it over the top? Was it silly? But it was violent. It had it had that rated R feel as where White House Down I think failed an aspect. Yeah. Olympus has fallen for me. Delivered. I know some people felt the opposite, but. This is a movie I just want to go back and feel like I'm watching a 1980s action movie. This is the type of movie I want to see Gerard Butler doing. I'm excited to see that. And also very excited because Angela Bassett, we're getting her mm. in stu uh, in studio, and I'm going to be interviewing her, and we'll air that on Thursday during Movie Talk. So I'm very, very interested to see this movie. I'm going to see it tonight with yourself. I might be having a special guest pop into our Schmoes review that you guys will be very excited about. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But um, we it, it's going to be fun. Is it going to be Angela Bassett? Uh, just watch. That'd be pretty exciting. <laughs> See, I, I can't give London Has Fallen the credibility of being like, it's a diehard knockoff. In no way is it anywhere close to the first three diehards. So I'd say when I saw Olympus Has Fallen, it was kind of like seeing another Under Siege movie, except a good one, not Under Siege 2. It's a when, funny movie. When though. I saw White House Down, that was like another Naked Gun movie. <laughs> I thought that was ridiculous, and it was just too, too bad and over the top. And it came out a few months after Olympus has fallen, that hasn't helped it out. Schnapp, you've been to London before. You enjoy their company. Do you uh, want yeah. to see the movie about that place? I don't falling? want to see it falling. I'll wait for the third movie, Earth Has Fallen. And then, like, it's Gerard Butler. It's Roland Emmerich is going to direct it. A bunch of spaceships show up and, like, shadows on the planet. Uh, the, the squirrels. Yeah. The first one? Squirrels getting, the getting some nuts. Uh, Did you yeah. see the first one? I have not seen Olympus Fallen, so maybe I should I wait for the trilogy Earth Has Fallen, or should I see London Has Fallen? You guys see, will tell see me. See Olympus Has Fallen, like because because the thing is, if you think if you don't like Olympus Has Fallen, you're definitely not going to like this. But I think I was just shocked because I was expecting a complete and utter stinker, and found my like it was it was really graphic, like a violent movie, but in it was a, like an eighties action. It film. felt like an eighties throwback action film. I'll it definitely really check did. out Olympus Has Fallen. Those two posters are freaking me out because it's like Zootopia Has Fallen. It's like <laughs> you see the top view of the you know exploding building and you see all these animals. 
running on the streets. Are, are they combined? Is it something together? All I know is that it's going to be a damn good day at the movies for me because I see Zootopia this afternoon. Then I get to go see London Has wow. Fallen tonight. You guys will get both those reviews on the Schmoes channel coming very, very soon. As of right now, it's time for mailbag if you want to get your email read on air by the lovely ashley or maybe even the ugly me we will do that for you if you email us at collidervideo at gmail.com and before we get to that we also want to remind you guys at the end of this here show we're going to take some of your live twitter questions you want to tweet us get your tweet read on air and have us answer it it's going to be at collider video that out of the way ashley what's in the mailbox matthew yamasaki writes i would like to know what your thoughts were on actor or actresses careers post comic book films for example toby mcguire kind of disappeared post his spider-man role and we kind of got a taste of what robert downey jr's career would look like post tony stark with the box office performance of the judge do actors like christian bale or andrew garfield still have a fighting chance now that they're both done with batman and spider-man thanks for taking my question and keep up the great work I don't know, man. I don't know if Christian Bale's got a shot in hell of being relevant ever again. Yeah, like, really worried about him. <laughs> I mean, Alfred. yeah, he was just nominated for an Academy Award, so I think he's doing okay. I understand the spirit of the question, though. Is like once you are a superhero, how do you rebuild your career or go on to different projects and stay relevant in Hollywood? But you know what? If you were already a superhero, especially one on the level of three Batman movies or three, let's let's split hairs and say two and a half good Spider-Man movies, then I, I don't know where you go from there other than just do other things. Like Christian Bale, he's not Batman anymore, but he's in an Oscar-nominated movie. Tobey Maguire is doing smaller films again. I know a lot of people didn't see Pawn Sacrifice, but he's phenomenal as Bobby Fischer in that movie. So you look at those two actors in particular, the big one for me is going to be where does Robert Downey Jr. go after he's done playing Iron Man? Because look, The Judge, it's not really a movie that's going to crush at the box office, so I'm not going to judge his clout based on one movie that he did in between Marvel films. I think Robert Downey Jr. has a fantastic career post Marvel ahead of him and I'm excited to see what he does Downey had see the thing with Downey is that Downey remember Downey was almost the the George Clooney role in Gravity Downey was mm -hmm. almost in Spotlight Downey had had a lot of opportunities to be in different movies but just has chosen not to do them um, for what reason we don't know but he's had a chance to kind of go past the Tony Stark thing but the problem is getting past that Tony Stark image at this point right. there are other actors that have gone through that look the, the late Christopher Reeve had a problem after Superman but then you look at someone like Michael Keaton Michael Keaton had a problem after Batman, right? And going through a lot of, we were talking about this yesterday, had like some of the, tried to do some of these serious roles, didn't really work. He took a break, came back, and now he's crushing. It's a long break. It's a long, it's a long, break. long I, break. I'm just saying it can happen. And then you look at someone like Bale and Garfield, Bale is just one of those talents that he's going to survive anything. The guy's already nominated for an Oscar this year. Mm -hmm. Andrew Garfield, young enough that also with Spider-Man, and the Spider-Man movies weren't as beloved as the Tobey Maguire ones were because it was like, okay, yeah, and he followed Tobey Maguire, so he wasn't he wasn't Spider-Man to everybody. Right. He's he still he was the Facebook guy also, yeah. and now he's going to be doing he's going to do Scorsese movies. He's going to be. Yeah. totally fine but there are people that fall into it and can't get out of it and there's other guys like the two that were brought up that are going to be fine Schnapp, yeah. you know billy zane was never the same after starring <laughs> in the phantom what do you think about <laughs> most actors after they leave their superhero tights well all i can say is can we go back to that image can you make that image full screen for a second that wistful ghost-like apparition of characters <laughs> long gone can you make that full screen for a minute it's like force oh, ghosts it. it's right oh, back there it? oh, so you, can... oh, you don't have oh. that ability? oh man anyway yeah. Uh, the hell a, is this? I had, a, I had a great bit that I was about to <laughs> yeah. do that's Where's been Alex ruined Price by technology. That? Anyway, um, those guys are, are, are going to forever be known as Spider-Man and Batman. Cut to 10, 15 years from now. A lot of the movies that they're doing that we currently see will kind of fall away. And these kind of iconic roles that really made a big impression, they'll always be known for that. Just like Michael Keaton is Batman, so is Christian Bale. He's Batman. I mean, even to a lesser degree, Val Kilmer and George Clooney are Batman. And so is Adam West. So you have a ton of Batmans, Jokers. You have one definitive Captain America. No one really remembers J.D. Salinger's son, Matt Salinger, as Captain America right. or Reb Brown from the TV show. People are like, Chris Evans is Captain America. Why? Because he was in such a great set of films so far. Not just the Captain Americas, but the Avengers. And he really fit that role. People, and successful ones, successful. too. Successful. Yeah. He was the Human Torch. No one cares. No one ever remembers him. They, oh, he was in those two sloppy, Fantastic Four movies. Who cares? He's Captain America. Yeah. And he does that role so well that it it really helps him in, in, in his desire to like, hey, I want to go direct a movie. Or I'm going to go be in this independent Snowpiercer film. And he kills it in all those films. 
because he's a good actor. Yeah, it so. helps. It helps. But the thing is, I think going to the, I think it's the fear as well too, because that movie that he did, albeit a small, a small film, people aren't rushing out to see that because right. Captain America directed right. it too. Right. It was a passion project yes. history. It was a limited release. Um, but you know, we don't know, and the critics actually panned it. He didn't do a Facebook rant about it. Right. Um, but <laughs> afterwards, it was a matter of, can, is he going to get back on the horse, do new things? Like you said, Snowpiercer, yeah. these other things, too. He's a guy that's going to be around for a bit as well, too. But people will say Ca Captain America getting stereotyped right. is one thing. Being able to survive it is another. But well, I think in, yeah. in the current climate of superhero movies, with the advent of all these team-ups and so many superheroes in one movie, it only helps the actor because there's so many people that are now playing superheroes that you're not going to identify them anymore like you did Christopher Reeve as Superman or even right. Michael Keaton as Batman. It's like Ben Affleck's playing Batman. We're not just going to know him for playing Batman anymore. You know, it, it, Some people have a harder time adjusting to it than others. Like Lou Ferrigno is always going to be the Hulk, but if Lou Ferrigno in today's world was playing the Mark Ruffalo character, I think it'd be easier for him to maybe go on and do other things. The well, difference though with Ben Affleck, though, is that with, with Christian Bale wasn't a huge star when, he, as far he was a known actor, but he wasn't a huge star. Sure, Affleck's an A-lister already. You know what I mean? He like, wasn't so, Batman; he was Bateman. In American Psycho. <laughs> right. Yeah, just one E, <laughs> remove right. that, then you're but, Batman. But I yeah. think that's the actual reverse of what people are worried about. I, I certainly was when, when Ben Affleck was cast. It was like, you're not going to see him as Bruce Wayne. You're going to see him as Ben Affleck right. playing Batman. My, my opinion has changed, but I don't know if that's the case for a lot of people. That's what the risk is for someone taking someone who's really known. Because Andrew Garfield, again, not very known. McGuire had been in a bunch of things, too. But still, superhero genre was really getting... He had X-Men, but he, that Spider-Man really kind of helped it. So he was in the forefront of all that as well, too. So it, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's weird. It's a weird one. You think about like Robert Redford as Superman instead of Christopher Reeve. That would have been a lot different. I mean, you know, you have someone who's a, a known uh, entity, a known property right. back then in the 70s playing the main character. I'm glad they went with an unknown and just yeah. like <laughs> rounded him off with Gene Hackman and Marlon Brando. You know what I mean? It was like, those are the choices that you don't have that much now. You're like, let's get unknown. They did it with Brandon Routh. I mean, this time with Henry Cavill, he wasn't that well known yet. Yeah. So, I mean, it kind of works. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But for the most part, no one really thinks of the Hulk as Edward Norton. Right. Now they think right. about Mark Ruffalo. He's burned in on that. I still think about Lou Ferrigno, but maybe that's just me. Ashley, what's next? Drew Lawrence writes, Hey guys, last week I was lucky enough to attend a pre-screening of Triple Nine before all of the reviews broke out. I absolutely loved the movie and was discouraged when I noticed the score was rotten on Rotten Tomatoes. Do you all think that Rotten Tomatoes scores are a fairly accurate rating system to go by when choosing which ticket to buy every Friday? Or do you think the system is flawed? Personally, I feel that a 50% rating means the movie is mixed and that you could either love it or hate it. Not that the movie fails at doing its job. Just wanted to know your thoughts. Love the show. I think that's a great question to ask. And the first thing I'll say is that like, you should not rely on any, I don't care if it's an aggregator or a singular critic, you should not rely on them to tell you if you should go see a movie or not. It's a great thing to factor in. But if you want to see Triple Nine, you should go see Triple Nine. If you want to see Gods of Egypt and you see that big, fat, stinking 12% of Rotten Tomatoes, go see the movie. You can factor in what we say, but I never want to precede anything by saying, oh yeah, I'm going to tell you, or some website is going to tell you whether you're going to enjoy a movie or not. Go in there with an open mind and see what comes out. I think you're going to find more often than not, you're going to agree with how they do it on Rotten Tomatoes because if it's at a 50%, you probably are going to like some of the movie, but most of it you're going to say was at least unlived up to potential. If a movie is very fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, you're probably going to really enjoy it. And if it's only at 12%, there's probably not a, peop a lot of people out there that are going to like that movie. Christian, we're both on Rotten Tomatoes. How do you see it? Well, it's funny though, too. A lot of people don't realize this is how it works, too. If, if you see something at like a 90 or an 80 Five percent. Does that mean that every one of those critics that they loved the movie? No, it doesn't. What from if you go, so Mark and I for when we score, if we go three out of five schmoes, decent movie, enough to get it fresh. Okay, but if we put that review on Rotten Tomatoes, it goes into the fresh. So even though we thought it was an okay movie, good enough. It goes into someone's like, oh, people think it's great. It doesn't work like that because there are certain reviews that I thought movie was fine, but I still not enough for me to say that it was rotten. So I'll put it in the fresh thing. Same thing with goes with a rotten movie. Like, so it might, there might be a movie that you see like uh, a forty five percent on something too, and I just it was okay. Just something I saw a million times before. I did two two and a half out of five schmoes, and then that also gets put into the rotten. So people don't realize that they just see that that thirteen percent or that eighty percent, and they just think good. 
bad. There's so much more. I would say go in, and if there's a particular review that you see that maybe speaks to your type of thoughts or someone that you that you trust, look at that person's review. Go through their kind of thought process as far as why they, they scored it the way that they mm-hmm. did. That's how you get more of an accurate thing, going through the actual reviews. Don't just go off the score because right. it's not as black and white as it looks from the percentages. Schnapp, you have an A on Rotten Tomatoes right now. That's how do right. you see this? Uh, very happy. Um, but you know how I, how I see it, how I've used Rotten Tomatoes in the past is I'll see a number and I'll be like, okay, say it's 85 or say it's 45, one of the two. But if it's a film I'm interested in, I'll click on it and then I'll see all the different people who've put in their reviews and I'll, I'll, quick, I'll quick read them because usually they have about a paragraph that's available to read. And then I'll click in on ones that seem pr- more interesting to me than other reviews. So it's like, I don't wanna read 40 reviews, but I'll, I might read six. If it's a film that I'm on the fence on, I might read all of the reviews, because then I wanna hear everybody's opinion, and that's how I kinda get my own personal roundup. Uh, I, I, never, I never look at audience uh, exit polls. That to me is like, you know, some people would love a film that I might hate, so I kind of know going into a film what I'm expecting. Even if the somebody says, oh, that movie is horrible, I'm like, look, but I'm gonna see it because it has these elements or it has this actor or it's directed by this person. So that's the way, the reason I go to film. So it's different for everybody. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I do love that you just go into like a movie like, and you know the Rotten Tomatoes score. I don't like reading other reviews before I see a movie. Luckily, I usually get to see them before they're released. So I have that advantage. But if I go in and I catch a Rotten Tomatoes score out of the corner of my eye, it is gonna, it, it, it's not gonna affect how I feel about the movie, but it's like, oh, okay, most people are leaning this way. I wonder if I'm gonna be different, but I'm always gonna tell you, I'm gonna shoot you straight. Did you have another thing to add for Rotten Tomatoes, Christian? No, I did not. Then we're on to live Twitter, ladies and gentlemen. The live Twitter questions are upon us. You guys tweeted in your questions. Ashley has been kind of like the Rotten Tomatoes. She's been aggregating the Twitter, and now we have some queries. All right, Justin Square writes, can you picture Ice Cube taking over for J.K. Simmons in the role of J. Jonah Jameson in the MCU? Um, I'm going to need you to read Ice that Cube question Ice Cube taking again. over for J.K. Simmons in the role of J. Jonah Jameson in the MCU. I don't hate that, actually. Wow. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, so I needed it reread. Hear it twice. <laughs> and then I think about Ice Cube because, look, look, I want J.K. Simmons back. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I want J.K. Simmons back a lot more than I want Liam Schreiber back as Sabretooth. I don't think that he's coming back. And if he's not coming back, we need somebody else. We need to do it differently. Ice Cube, when you watch him in the 21 and 22 Mm. Jump Street movies, that is hysterical. And that's kind of what you want out of J. Jonah Jameson. So I never thought about it before. I never put two and two together. It's kind of a good idea, right? uh, Parker, get over here. Just I can't even do an Ice Cube. I could see it. I could see him yelling and freaking out and flipping a desk. 21 Jump Street, perfect. Like his tryout audition to be J. Jonah Jameson. I I, lo- I, I should buy that t shirt of iced tea with a bunch of ice cubes floating with in it. With a haircut, too. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's a great suggestion. It's funny. Like, part of me why I love it is because of the fact that he's done it uh, on 21, 20 Jump Street. The other reason I don't like it is because he's already done it on 21 and 22 Jump Street. It's right. like, I'm just worried that he would do it. But like, he's just doing the same thing that he did in 21, 22 Jump Street. But then it's like, he's so good at that. So, I, I wouldn't hate if he got cast. I just know that those comments would come in after after he did but he's basically doing the same thing all right ashley what's up alexander burton writes with all of the films coming out on netflix and none coming out into theaters is adam sandler's non-netflix movie career over uh i'm not gonna weep for adam sandler i mean the dude's making bank no matter what he does i don't know the the next project that he does that's on netflix has got to be something where he's collaborating with somebody else it's going to be hard for adam sandler to open a movie but look western comedies it's tough to buy into a western comedy in general whether it's the ridiculous six or lightning jack or whatever else you have since Blazing Saddles right. set the bar so incredibly high you just can't surpass it so if he does do another Netflix movie he'll probably like he did in Ridiculous 6 recruit a lot of his friends but it's got to be more of a mainstream premise I think to get the audience <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes Christian what <laughs> your hand is like it, it's, it's like, going like this. it's like yeah. thing I'm from sure. the Adams family just is like sur- I'm sc- I was literally it's, scr- it's like, I was literally scratching he's my worried, head yes, yeah. he's, yeah. Worried yes. he's worried about you he's worried about you this hand worried. this hand's about to do some major I was damage. literally oh scratching my hands. <laughs> you like, can, can you I tell feel, these I guys spent a lot of time kid. together? These, I said, they, they're judging each other's movements. Like, what's, what are you trying to say? <laughs> my hand is itchy, but what are you really trying to yeah. say? <laughs> I'm touching my palm in a weird way. It's time for you to shut up or be funny. I don't know. It's just my hand. That actually encapsulates our entire relationship. It is, it does. Christian, what was your thought? I'm not going to tell you now. <laughs> what the hell are we talking about? <laughs> Ice Cube and Ice Tea together talk, again. We just talked about Ice Cube. 
you. No, oh we're God. talking about whether Adam Sandler no, has yeah, a no. career what, on Netflix or not. What I think Adam Sandler should do is go back to dramatic acting. Like, the guy is a really good dramatic yes. actor, man. I mean, Punch Drunk Love and Spanglish and... Even uh, Wedding Singer. Wedding Singer, but even... even though it's a comedy. Even uh, uh, the Funny People. The funny, yeah, funny, funny People. Funny, uh, funny People? Funny People, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Funny People. So, like, when, he, when he's able to tap into the dramatic side... He's really likable. He's really believable. It's I get why he was doing all the. Right. I get all that. All because from, uh, it was time. making a lot of money. Yeah. Even the crappy ones, Jack and Jill, all those movies, they made money. But now it's starting to go away. Dude, get back into dramatic acting. You're good at it. There are a lot of people, comedic actors, that would die to do what he does. He's really good. So I'd like to see him if he's going to do a Netflix movie or a Netflix series. Do something like, like cast Adam Sandler in like a Netflix series. That's the way for him to get out of that hole. Yeah, Pixels would scare me. That performance at the box office is like, dude, you better do Grown Ups 3 or come in with a great premise or just mm. do back do a smaller movie. Not as tiny and as poorly reviewed as The Cobbler ended up being, but right. something in that vein is what I would say. Now, is that... <laughs> Is that something? Is that something that you would want to see Adam Sandler do? I know everyone's like, "Hey, I agree with you. Punch Drunk Love was great, but you need a great script and you need a yeah. great director before you can get that performance right. Don't just out do of dramatic." That's to what do I'm dramatic. saying. Before right, you can get right. that performance out of Adam Sandler, his basic go-to is to go hang out with his buddies and make a, a, a silly film that's yeah. fun for them to make. And if the audience likes it, who cares? It's like we're, they're making something that's fun for them to make, and that's kind of what I get from most of his films. So, will he push himself? To have outside people like, I want to do a Netflix series. I'm going to hire these writers, this director. I'm going to push myself. But is that what the audience actually wants? Is that what Adam Sandler fans want? I, I'm an Adam Sandler fan. I just want to laugh again. Yeah. Well, I just, exactly. Just, you want Happy Gilmore yeah. too. So I think he should make that. But I think if you look at something like what Kevin Smith is doing right now, right. Kevin Smith is clearly making movies just for himself, whether it be Yoga Hosers or Tusk. Or Tusk. He's making, and he says as much, he's doing movies for himself, and the budgets are nothing right he's doing it adam sandler is making those movies with his friends with huge budgets right so that is going to get pricey if they're not making but money. i don't think they're for himself anymore i think that they're trying to appeal to a mass audience right it's just so hard to right. do that if you don't care about it anymore well, yeah, so. the ridiculous six falls into the idiocracy audience so there is an audience right. there so i mean you know unfortunately <laughs> you don't really want those people to be you know that's like you know let's make a let's make a funnier film is what i'd say yeah all right so ashley we're going to do one more what question has Ooh, twitter handed more. us all right mark Marcus Howard writes, has studio interference with a project ever made a movie better? If not, why do they still continue to do it? Uh, I, look, I think it has. I'm sure that a studio has come in and said, we got to stop this ship. This is going really, really bad right now. I wish I had some studio heads interfering with what's happening on set. I just don't have that kind of clout yet. So like, look, if you're a student and you come in and you fix a movie, the problem is you're not going to get any credit for it. Nobody's going to say, man, that studio really came in and saved that movie. It's just not going to happen like that, but you will get blamed for it. That's the thing. Again, like if you direct a movie that it's going to be your praise or your blame. If you're the studio that makes a movie people are just going to hate you because you're in suits and you have cigars and you green light stuff and you don't give the green light to other movies so when a movie comes out and it's good it's all because the artist fought against the system and when a movie's bad they're usually going to blame the system right well for sometimes in certain cases yes certain cases no i mean uh check out any article you've ever read from any director who's made a film with harvey weinstein you've heard horror stories because he basically manhandles the film takes it away and re-edits it so that's kind of what he does so if you get in bed with harvey weinstein and you're not quentin tarantino your film is not going to be your film when you're done with it and you either accept that or you don't because that's those rules of the game it's a certain thing when you sign on to do a production with anybody you got to know who you're playing with and it's like there's certain uh you know team members or production companies where you're like, look, we're all working on this together. I'm making a film, but I know in the end run, I'm making a film for this mass audience. So I'm going to, I'm going to trust the producers or the company that I'm working for to come in and like make suggestions to change certain things. If you're making your own independent film that you wrote, you produced, you're directing, it's your vision, try to make it yourself as much as possible and keep everyone else's hands out of the pocket because that way it stays true to exactly what you're trying to do. If you're making a a production like I'm sure Zootopia had a lot of producers involved and they were making it for a mass audience so that's what happens is like hey what if we added this scene somebody else maybe what about sloths it's a team effort so that's what I how I look at it from the writer to the producer to the director to the actual company itself is a team effort Harloff you trust the fat cats listen 
Make no mistake about it. Every studio film has studio people involved. Mm -hmm. It is the way that it works. You're working at Warner Brothers for about three years, it is constant. Now, the, the thing is, it's when you hear about it. When it goes wrong and someone is complaining about it, that's when we go, leave them alone, studio. And there are certainly those times and those cases. It happens, it happens a lot. It's when the really good movies do you don't think that Christopher Nolan had some assistance from I think like Greg Silverman Jeff Robinoff when he was making those movies over and of course he did now did he but did he rely on them all the time no it was a lot of they, they trusted in him and he trusted in them to let him do certain things it's a collaborative process with what they do with the studio you find some executives that you really work with as filmmakers you need the executives totally. to do stuff and they and they do and there are really great executives out there too and you look at look at somebody like what JJ Abrams comes out who's one of the first people that that he thanks he thanks Alan Horn you know mm -hmm. he thanks Bob Iger because those are people who are working right now and the movie was successful it's when things start to go being a disaster and things and everyone starts pointing fingers right. and we as fans when we hear the negative we go leave our favorite people alone because right. we don't know the suits we right. don't know their names we don't care about them because we care about the people that we're watching and that are making the things we love yeah Disney not a bad example of a studio that, that will definitely have say in it but they kind of let the artist be the artist by Converse 1977 Fox is like we can't give George Lucas an unlimited amount of money here so we're only going to give you this amount of money go make a movie that ended up working out okay too all right so if you're a studio collaborate don't dominate that's going to do it <laughs> for us here on Movie movie talk uh, i want to thank first of all the gentlemen at the pan the very handsy gentlemen that are sitting next <laughs> to me schnapp what do you got where can people hey, find you you guys can follow me on twitter and instagram just at john schnapp watch heroes today collider heroes it's going to be on around five o'clock we're going to talk about a whole bunch of sweaty news speaking of sweaty i got a brand new documentary it's called sweaties unite rise of the uber nerd you can go to kickstarter right now and help make me help make help me make this documentary it's about comic book movies and comic books check it out Gonna skip right over Christian and go to Ashley. <laughs> it's fine. Christian George Harloff, my dear friend, yeah. who's got very, very huge hands and had three quesalupes this morning for breakfast. Where can the kids find you? The hell are you talking about, man? Uh, you can find me at Christian Harloff Twitter, Instagram. I'm doing a lot of Facebook Live. Uh, that's if you want to go over there, check that out. You can check out me and this knucklehead on Schmoes No, where we do a bunch of reviews. We'd love to have you guys over there too, because we're bringing back the live show very, very soon from the Collider Studios. And the Schmodown Movie Trivia Contest is a coming. You got Schnapp versus Finstock, John Campia versus Dan Merle. A lot of great matches that are coming up very soon. We're hoping to air the first one at the end of March. We also want to hear from you guys. Tweet me out. Do it here. Who do you want to see compete in the movie space? Dream matchups, all that stuff. It's going to be the UFC of movie trivia. You're going to love it. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Miss Ashley Mova. Where can the kids find you? On Twitter and on Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. It is indeed Taco Tuesday here at the Collider Studios. We want to remind you guys, there's lots of great movies that are coming out and are already playing at AMC Theaters. So just head over to amctheaters.com for all of your ticket and showtime information. Bookmarkcollider.com. That's where we get a lot of our movie news. That's where you will as well. Enjoy that website. And of course, subscribe. Subscribe here at Collider with Video and subscribe to Christian I's YouTube channel, Schmoes No. As for this little guy, you can find me on all the social media networks at Mark Ellis Live. See you at the comedy store in Hollywood this weekend. Until then, peace out. Oh no, that's his line. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.